For those of you who don't know me, uh, it's okay, not a lot of people do, even in my own institution. You can see here from, uh, from where I come from, uh, we're the Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine um, and Northwell Health, we're about 21 hospital systems, uh, and I work somewhere right about here uh, in Manhattan in our western region at uh, one of our tertiary care hospitals. <coughs> Um, if you take it down to street level, uh, this is a view from Park Avenue, um, and you can see uh, these are our operating rooms right up here, uh, in, uh, and you can probably see me somewhere in, in the window here. This was taken a few years ago, trying to figure out how we could get our, our administration to pay for a few multi-million dollar instruments so that we could do ambulatory surgery. Um, and Turns out that you really just have to act like a New Yorker and complain to your parents that um, all the other kids on the Upper East Side are doing it, so we need one too. Um, and so we've, we've been able to acquire a few, and here's uh, our latest system that we've got in March. Uh, you can still see there's some, uh, some of the, the stickers are on it as if it just came off the car lot, and I was actually the first, first person that got to use it, so I was pretty excited about that. Um, it's a tough act to follow for my colleague here uh, in the sense that um, I'm not going to try to hit a home run here in terms of, of goals uh, in the few minutes that I have. Um, I'm not going to teach you how I do an inguinal hernia or how you should do an inguinal hernia. There are better venues for that and far better teachers, to be frankly. Um, but we are going to discuss, generate a discussion about robotic hernia repair and inguinal uh, with a focus on ambulatory hernia. Um, and I'm going to make an argument that robotic inguinal hernia surgery is different than anything before it, and I think, and also that being a surgeon is pretty awesome. So I'm going to start with some questions to you guys. They're rhetorical, obviously. Um, but in 2008, what was your preferred method of repairing an inguinal hernia? Uh, <clears throat> for for me, uh, it was a time when I was going through uh, and learning from some of the grizzled veterans here at Sages how to do laparoscopic TEP repair, um, and um, for me, the one thing that I remember about that experience was that it was so obvious to me that it was better. Um, it, it was so obvious to me that, that this was something that I needed to really learn and get good at so I could offer to patients. Um, the other repairs are, are good, but I just happened to learn laparoscopic TEP. Now, if we move ahead <coughs> to 2018, in comes robotic hernia surgery uh, over the last few years, right? And so I asked the question again to myself, what is my preferred method of performing an inguinal hernia repair? And it's still laparoscopic TEP. Um, and, and the reason for that is that, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've done very good. We've, we've been able to streamline our processes, drive the cost down of these repairs, uh, and change hurts. It's hard to rope the boat. But when you look at someone coming in, and what I can tell from the people that uh, are coming in to apply to my residency program and our fellowship program is that they're not asking whether or not they're going to learn laparoscopic TEP. They're asking whether or not they're going to learn robotic surgery. And if I put myself back in their position at their time, it, I probably felt the same way. So why is there this movement? <coughs> um, you know, perhaps People say we're giving the traditionally open hernia surgeons a wonderful new tool that will allow them to start offering what we know can be a beneficial and minimally evasive approach. Um, no, <laughs> that's, that's not the case. That's not why this is happening, I don't think. And I'm going to show Dr. Olenikov's quote here from his paper last year um, that shows that there's a negative trend for laparoscopic utilization in 2008 to 2015, and there was an increase in robotic hernia repairs. Um, so what I think this really suggests is that <clears throat> you're taking a bunch of people that are very good at one thing and they're cannibalizing themselves. I can tell from my own department of surgery, our open hernia surgeons are not lining up at the console. Um, you know, they're not. Uh, and, and so they're not learning these things. It's people like you, uh, you know, who are minimally invasive surgeons that are sort of learning these things. Um, and so, 
this is a mouthful, but this is from Dr. Kudzi, um, you know, who you may know from the robotic surgery and hernia community. And it's transitioned from laparoscopic, totally extra peritoneal inguinal hernia repair to robotic transabdominal peritoneal inguinal hernia repair, a retrospective review of a single surgeon's experience. Uh, I lovingly call it Omar Kudzi, a hernia surgery story, um, you know. And he has some real numbers. And when we start looking at inguinal hernia and the data that we have on it, this was this is a tough this is a tough thing to talk about because it's not as mature as colorectal cancer or 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 pelvic oncologic surgery um, <clears throat> for a lot of different reasons. Um, we look here what Dr. Kudzi has said uh, with this paper, and what he basically describes is that during his learning curve, he just kind of flew right into the asteroid belt, uh, and, and these guys just started doing their hardest cases with the robot. Um, and the outcomes, when they look back retrospectively on their, on their, on their, on their patients, are, are similar. Uh, similar rates of inguinodynia, singular weights of seroma, and their general outcomes are, are pretty much the same. Um, which is good, and it begs the question, are we utilizing this tool correctly? Should we be utilizing it for our harder cases? Even on our learning curve, a little bit cowboy like Han Solo. Um, so what else could it be? Um, cost is always a factor. Uh, we have to say to ourselves, well, robotic surgery, it has to, it has to be cheaper somehow. There has to be some type of, of money factor. <laughs> it's, it's not cheaper. And again, we're talking about ambulatory surgery. So this is, these patients are supposed to go home. They're supposed to be in the hospital for less than a day. Um, it's not cheaper. <clears throat> right here, I, I just love this paper because it was no nonsense. Dr. Higgins sort of brought this up. Um, and it's presented in <coughs> surgical endoscopy, where they show that there is absolutely a price difference between laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair in the traditional sense versus robotic. Now, you can get really fancy, and I think that when you start, when you look at the most luxurious laparoscopic repair, and I'm talking about firing, you know, tackers into the air and using $100 bills for mesh, uh, and you compare it to the most restricted laparoscopic or robotic procedures, uh, and then you take into account amortization and depreciation of the systems, you might be able to, to, to sort of get your numbers where they need to be. And make no mistake, we utilize those in our discussions in trying to get more systems. But at the end of the day, it's, it's hard to make an argument that this is, this is money driven. Last year, right here, a conversation between Dr. Lanikoff and Dr. Vogels, and we're talking about ambulatory surgery here again. When you look at the cost of ambulatory surgery centers, the lowest cost hernia repair is about $800, and, the, and it's going to be significantly higher than that, up to three times higher than that. Well, let me tell you something, that the cost of hernia repair on the Upper East Side of Manhattan is astronomical, right? So here we have <coughs> all of these things saying, why would you even do this? Um, and I can tell you, this is right here is our Manhattan Eye, Ear, and Throat Hospital. It's our ambulatory surgery hospital, which is separate from our other hospital. And this is obviously a fake picture because there's never any parking outside of it. <clears throat> um, and I can tell you that despite all this, we just had uh, last month, you know, our, we took delivery of, of, our, uh, of our ambulatory surgery robot, which, you know, by definition is going to be used exclusively for ambulatory surgery procedures, and it's, a, it's part of our administration to actually move many of our, many of our <coughs> surgeries uh, you know, up into this area. So we talk about the robot and the relationship with the robot and as, as inguinal hernia surgeons. I mean, I say, you know, so are we crazy? Hello, robot, you know, are we crazy? Oh, maybe, maybe we are, right? It's gotta be the medicine, right? I mean, so when we talk about, when we talk about inguinal hernia surgery and, and surgeons, and we're looking, we're data-driven, right? The, the artist in me, the, the idealist has to say, there has to be a better way, right? Um, but the, the surgeon and the scientist in me, when you look at the data on this, it's, it's not mature yet. It's not there. Um, it's not known if robotic inguinal hernia surgery is gonna give you a better repair. Is it at least not worse? Um, Maybe, maybe it's at least not worse. So we can see when we look back at some of the retrospective studies that I showed you uh, that 
some of our colleagues here in this very room have, have performed. Um, <clears throat> so we talk about an old problem, a new sur a loose solution. Being a surgeon is now sort of better than ever. I just spent a bunch of time sort of discussing to you why in the heck would we do this, right? I mean, I told you that we're cannibalizing our own practice. We're not getting new surgeons to utilize the technology yet and provide a minimally invasive approach to patients that would otherwise not have it. And it's costing us more money <laughs> and we're not making any more money doing it. And we're not sure if scientifically it's better <clears throat> uh, and probably it's, it's not, uh, it's, just about, it's just about the same. So the devil is in the details and <clears throat> like anything else, I think that we have to start asking questions about this in a different way than, than we have before. Um, and I'm gonna just do a quick analogy here. How many of you in the room are gamers? Yeah, I, I thought that that would be the answer. Um, but <clears throat> right here is, a, is, a, is an Xbox controller. Uh, it's a gaming console controller that's uh, pretty much a, a normal one. And here's another one called the Elite version of, of, of the same controller. All right, there's a three times the price. So when I ask my kids, what the heck is the difference of this? They're like, well, dad, you know, you don't really need one of these. You don't need the, the, the long one, the big one. I said, okay. <clears throat> but it turns out that there's a new profession called professional gaming, where people are actually making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year playing these games. And when you ask them, these elite gamers, why that's better, they'll tell you things like, you can move things around better. The buttons are different. The weight of it is different. It's heavier. I can react faster. There are these little things on the bottom of it that you can, that you can utilize to move your character around the screen better. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's gonna come down to the fact, especially in ambulatory surgery, again, different than oncology and, and things that are done as an inpatient, um, if the tool is better, why would you not use it, right? Um, when we're looking at <clears throat> when you look at a two-dimensional picture versus a three-dimensional picture, of course I'd want to use that. Ask your non-tech savvy neighbor if they think their surgeon should see in two dimensions or three dimensions uh, when they're going to get their hernia repair. Um, why would I not want to move my wrist uh, inside the pelvis for an ambulatory surgery procedure uh, when it, I, can, I can suture better with it or more easily? Um, so I think that the value in ambulatory surgery and, and, and inguinal hernia surgery <coughs> in particular is going to come from the fact that it's these things that we need to start looking at that are different than the traditional sense of, of surgery. You're all excellent surgeons in the room, I'm sure, that it wouldn't take you long to do an inguinal hernia, laparoscopic, robotic. I'm sure your outcomes are very good. And I think that moving forward, we, start to, we need to start looking at some other things about why um, why ambulatory surgery and inguinal hernia surgery in particular um, will be better with a robotic approach. Um, so we talk about sort of this marriage, right? It's a, it's a new relationship for us uh, in inguinal hernia surgery as a, as a profession. Um, it's been a very, very, very quick courtship, um, but I think that you know, we need to do a little bit more due diligence and, and start asking some questions. Uh, in the sense of the marriage, I just took, um, I do a little photography on the side. I Something old from back home, right? Something new. Uh, all of you guys will know this Freedom Tower. Something borrowed. This was actually one of the Chihuly structures from, from Seattle to the Botanical Garden in New York, which I think are beautiful and something blue. Um, so I thank you very much for your time, uh, and I hope that over the next few years, as you guys you know start to do these and and have been doing them, that we see some more uh, we see some more numbers in terms of of the science behind it, so we can look as good as our colleagues in colorectal and and, uh, and oncologic surgery. Appreciate it.